Welcome to Let's Talk Learning Technology. Do you know the latest in learning technology? Matt and Walter do. From learning authoring tools and animation to virtual reality and everything in between, innovative learning groups Matt Curtin and Walter Schermacher geek out on all of it. Get their perspectives on the latest trends, tips, and tricks, and recommendations so your learning tech keeps up with the times. Hi, and welcome everyone to Let's Talk Learning Technology, or as we affectionately refer to it, LT Squared. I'm Matt Curtin, Senior Director of Technology and Visual Design at Innovative Learning Group. And I'm Walter Schermacher, a programmer at ILG. With us today is Dr. James Clarkson, an Assistant Professor of Surgery at Michigan State University and co-founder and Chief Medical Officer of Wide Awake VR. So in today's episode, we're going to talk with Dr. Clarkson about Wide Awake VR. To kick things off, why don't you tell us a little bit about Wide Awake VR and why you started offering VR to patients? So Wide Awake VR is a company uh, that uh, I've co-founded with uh, a couple of other people in order to create a virtual reality device that can be easily applied to patients undergoing awake medical procedures, for which there are lots of reasons to avoid anesthesia. Um, I started doing it uh, back when I was um, attempting to start a program of awake hand surgery in Michigan, at Michigan State, back in 2016. And my patients had become so used to being put to sleep and taken to treatment centers for some of the most simple of these hand surgeries. Now, when I offered them the opportunity to do it more conveniently in the office, many of them just said, oh, oh, I don't think I can do that. Just put me out, doc. I don't want to know anything about it. And um, I got sort of rather frustrated by this because I've been trained in the British National Health and different populations have different expectations. And most of my patients in the British National Health have been quite happy to have local anesthetic. As long as it was delivered nicely, um, it's not very frightening to have local anesthetic. But the patients in Michigan were absolutely dead set on being put to sleep. And it was that evening I got home after a particularly frustrating day. And my kids and I were playing uh, some virtual reality uh, games on, a, on the new Galaxy S6 that I just got. And um, what I found was that as the kids were involving themselves with their virtual worlds and when I got in there, I got a real sense that that this was probably going to be enough for my patients to tolerate the awake procedures. And I was just itching to, to give it a go. So I took the device in the following week. And I tried it on a patient who had an anxiety disorder, and she was absolutely terrified of general anesthesia. So it was a great, great patient to start with, but she was almost as terrified of awake surgery as she was of general anesthetic. So she really needed some help uh, to tolerate the local anesthetic. And it made such a difference for her. She was really engaging with the um, the virtual reality she was uh, the, the experience that I had given her was a farm experience. So she was surrounded by goats and dogs that were coming up to talk to her in the farm. And she was just totally engaged with them while we did the surgery. And that was when the penny dropped. I realized that firstly, patients need the option. And secondly, there is no reason to treat fear with an anesthetic. If fear is your main concern, then we need to find other ways to treat that. How does the VR help the patient experience? Well, what it does is that it puts them into a, I mean, they're obviously fully aware and conscious. They're not sedated. So there's no fooling them. You're not, you're not, you're not kidding anybody that they know they're having surgery, but it fills their mind with an experience, a bit like being the driver of a car. Their focus is on the road ahead of them and that the surgeon has now become the passenger in the car and they have the radio playing. So their, their mind and their focus is on the road. They're listening to the music, but they may have a passenger that they're talking to as well. And the, the brain can, can channel different um, and put different weight on different aspects of, of the experience that it's receiving. And by doing that, it really defocuses the patient's attention from the fear and anxiety they might have from the, the thought of having surgery. It's kind of it's an interesting idea of a, of a way to try and tackle that. You mentioned goats, but do you, what kind of experiences do you offer patients? Um, well, in fact, I've, I've no longer got that experience. That's lost to the mist of time. But um, we're now using, uh, there's a very beautiful, uh, in terms of animals, there's a nice one with sled dogs taking you on a, on a ride through Quebec, which was made by a company called Targo, which we've chosen as one of my more popular pieces. 
Uh, it doesn't tend to be so popular in summer, but uh, in wintertime when it's all snowy up here, the patients love to ride through the snow and being drawn by these dogs. And, and it's a documentary about how to look after the animals, how sled riding works, um, and it's very ethnically appropriate for Michigan and the up north uh, kind of mood. Um, and then we've also got some beautiful experiences from Felix and Paul, who are a Montreal company uh, making virtual reality experiences. One of them is a, a really fabulous tour of the White House by Barack and Michelle Obama. Um, and that's a, almost a historical piece now. It was in 2016. So life was very different back then. And then we have some very up-to-date ones they've just made from the International Space Station where you're being interviewed uh, or you, you're, you're seeing one-to-one uh, conversations with the ast- the astronauts themselves and zero gravity. And again, that is a, a really amazing um, experience. It gives you what's known as the overview effect. So you look through the cupola windows in the space station down at Earth to see the sunrise. So there's a real spiritual aspect to that. Again, we're trying to pick things that patients won't have ever seen before. We're not trying to show them Netflix. We're trying to show them something that's um, amazing that really fills their mind with a sense of place and a sense of wonder with a reasonable musical soundtrack to go with it. It sounds like, yeah, it does sound like you've picked some, some really interesting experiences. I mean, I've, I've done those where I was at, you know, I'm like a freighter in the Arctic and seeing all the ice yeah. go by and it's very engaging. So, yeah. And I imagine also you're looking for experiences where they're, they're watching what's going on, but they're not interacting or doing things because you want them to stay still. Yeah. Yeah, and that's one of the trickier areas because we're now developing a a product for dentists. And so we're having to pick very carefully, pick material where the focus of the attention doesn't vary in its direction. Um, And that can still be an immersive experience. You don't need to look around at a scene when the only action is right in front of you. But you do have to pick experiences that that the action doesn't move from left to right across the screen or your dentists are going to get quite cross as their instruments start, start starting to be thrown across the room. Now, there's another part that I'm interested in, particularly because we develop custom learning and performance support solutions, including VR solutions as well. I'm really curious about that part where you educate the patients after the surgery. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, and that's really one of the exciting components to the virtual experience, right? So, you obviously get patients' education through a number of different channels. We know many of them fail. For example, the printed the printed statements that you get on a discharge from a hospital, they get snowed under a whole bundle of papers of, of really that is just jibber-jabber nonsense, this electronic health record printout stuff. So that very quickly gets lost. Um, we know that patients who are waking up from an anesthetic have no recall at all for many hours. So you can't educate them in that postoperative phase. And so instead, you educate them by proxy and you tell their relatives. And we then also know that relatives and patients often can't really remember what the surgeons tell them because surgeons are rather scary figures. They're, you know, the surgeon's looking right at you and he's saying things. And that can be very off-putting and can make people nervous and fear will blind you to the facts. You very often can't remember things. So. I actually, I, I suffer from a bit of social phobia myself and I frequently will forget people's names on an introduction. So I know how that works. Um, so what's exciting about VR is that it subtracts the fear from the experience. So you are no longer blocking information that's coming to you. And because you're an audience of one, now you can deliver really immersive educational material to the patients, which is something that we're really looking forward to flowering and fully uh, fully developing. At this stage, we're using uh, me talking to the patients in a in a um, one-to-one environment, explaining to them why they're having surgery, what the pathology behind the surgery is in layman's terms, and generally what does the surgery involve, and explain to them about virtual reality and how that works too. Um, and then we then put them into an entertainment sequence for however long the surgery takes. And then at the end, when the surgeon's putting on the dressings, We then take them to a post-operative debrief where, again, we go over what to expect after surgery and how to get better from their surgery and what to do if things aren't right after the surgery. So when they emerge from their experience, they're mindful, they're relaxed, and they give me um, scores when I ask them, a very high scores for joy, for example. Um, They frequently give me eight or nine out of ten for just pure enjoyment 
And this is during an awake surgical procedure. So this is a very good environment, I think, to be absorbing data, not frightened or, or um, overwhelmed, but joyful and satisfied. So you mentioned hand surgery and you talked about maybe possibility of dental. I was wondering, too, if you were thinking about using it for giving shots. I know my daughter is very, very afraid of getting shots and distracting her would be good. But are there other areas that you envision expanding into? Absolutely. Well, can you think of any place where a patient, adult or child gets frightened? And then that is the environment that we're aiming for. There are so many areas within medicine that... Every time we speak to somebody in medicine, uh, we speak to a new health system or a new surgeon or a new physician's group, we find a new use case that they think that would be great. One of them is bone marrow biopsies at McLaren Hospital here in Greater Lansing. Um, and then shortly, they're going to be using virtual reality for those patients. And then another one is obviously needle sticks for children in offices, inoculations and jabs for children. And in fact, there's just a huge amount of application throughout pediatrics. Um, pediatrics already has a great deal of science behind patient distraction. Um, so we're not trying to say that they haven't already got a lot of distraction, but you can never do enough. But what's really missing is adult distraction and, and, it, and, and just accepting the fact that you don't have to suck it up buttercup, um, that adults also are frightened as hell and are just as frightened as children, but are you know, perhaps a little bit more able to control it, but that doesn't make the experience any nicer. So I'm very sympathetic towards the adult child, if you know what I mean. Where do you see this technology going in the future? I would like to see it, uh, and what we're doing by having uh, commercialized it, um, we see it as, as becoming a, a cultural force that will help to empower doctors and patients to choose awake options for their surgery or their procedure, and also to generally improve the patient's experience throughout hospital and other clinical environments. So both an improvement aspect, because we know that hospitals are are fairly hostile places for the human soul, and I don't think any of us would disagree about that, Um, but also to, to reduce our exposure to unnecessary sedation, which after all, is frequently only used because the patients are afraid, like my first patient. If we can offer them something that doesn't require sedation, suddenly you can detach the patient from the industrial monster that is the huge, you know, very offering anesthesia is a very elaborate and dangerous procedure. Um, You're having to suspend breathing, paralyze patients, ventilate patients. If you can, if you can detach the patient from that world, Not only is it safer for our elderly and indeed safer for all of us, but it's also incredibly cheap. Um, uh, you know, and that's one of the, one of the other things that we're having to face is that not only is healthcare becoming overwhelmingly expensive, but we're also having overwhelmingly more surgery than it used to. And we have to find a way, some middle ground for those sorts of cases that could be done without general central anesthesia. Um, and, I'd like to see it introduced as an option uh, for patients who are undergoing things like knee surgery in hospital settings where the knee can be made entirely numb, the whole leg can be made entirely numb, and that really the only reason that the patient is getting an anesthetic at all is to keep them under control so they don't make a fuss during surgery to keep their um, fear and emotion under control. And if we can do that with a virtual experience, I think there's a real benefit. When I'm 77 and I need my knee surgery, I don't want a whole lot of general anesthetic. It's not good for my brain. Um, colonoscopy is another area where we're exploring colonoscopy use cases with a surgeon in New York and also a surgeon at Michigan State. We haven't yet started, but we're going to start trialing that. Um, and, um, you know, they, they really the use cases go on and on from there. It's uh, fascinating. I, I thank you, Dr. Clarkson, for sharing this with us. Uh, obviously, you're focused in on healthcare, but I think about all the places where virtual reality might help people, maybe people who are afraid of flying and things like that as well. Um, it just gets, gets my mind spinning. Yeah, I, it has a huge application. And one of the things that was difficult um, initially, if you remember, virtual reality is a first person, by definition, it's actually first person controlled virtual environment. Um, Actually, what we're doing is a third-person control immersive environment. In other words, the patients aren't themselves 
yet familiar enough with VR. It's, it's not a common enough device that people want to operate it themselves. It's stressful to expect somebody to understand how to use those aerial mouse paddles that we use. Um, the controllers, the, the wireless controllers. Um, and instead we are choosing what they're going to see controlled from a tablet. I mean, obviously that will blend with first person use as time goes by. I'd like to see patients using uh, VR as first person experience where they might control flying a plane or, or, uh, um, in, in an interactive story. And that's all planned for the future. But, but the, the biggest thing for us was divorcing the headset from the surgeon because I was having to put it on my own head to, to queue up the, the, uh, uh, the experience and then put it on the patient. And that's what wide awake VR has really helped to achieve is creating that patient safety environment where we know that the patient's really not having to control the system themselves and we know exactly what they're watching and we can see what they're watching on another screen. I think the proof is in the pudding that you're achieving the better outcomes for the patients, and that's very exciting. So best of luck to you as you continue to roll out Wide Awake VR. We wish you continued success. Thank you very much. If you want to learn more about VR, we posted some resources at the bottom of this episode's page. We've also posted information about Dr. Clarkson and Wide Awake VR. If you have any learning technology topics you'd like us to talk about, uh, Matt and I are on Twitter. You can also send us an email at marketing at innovativelg.com. Thank you for listening.